Often in mathematics, you'll come across a result that's unexpected or mysterious. But when you look deeper and view the problem from a certain perspective, the answer becomes clear. The statement is now obvious and the mystery is gone. At a moment like this, you might say, oh, I get it now. And those are good moments for learning. But with the busy beaver function, those moments are rare. Instead, you get a lot of, what? Is this true? Like, how am I supposed to interpret this? It just, the mystery only deepens as you look into this thing. It's, it's crazy. So in this video, I'll try to create this unusual experience as I answer the biggest questions following my first video on the topic. To start, I'll refresh some basics. A Turing machine is a mathematical object that can represent any computation. And a computation is a finite sequence of steps applied to an input to produce an output. That's extremely general and includes everything your computer does. So these machines are remarkable because they fully represent something general with something concrete and specific. In particular, the input to a binary Turing machine is an infinitely long tape made up of ones and zeros. The machine will read from and write onto this tape. Its behavior and the computation it represents is determined with a state table. That is, the table determines exactly how the machine turns the input tape into the output tape. Now let's restate sigma n, which I'll now call the ones function instead of the busy beaver function. You'll see why later. We start by considering all n state Turing machines. So for a given n, that's many machines to consider. Then we run each on a tape of all zeros. Now we define, of all machines that halted, sigma n is the max count of ones written. And this, as we saw, is a wild function that computation itself cannot touch. In particular, if f of n is any computable function, then there exists some integer such that beyond that point, sigma n is larger. In other words, given any computable function, sigma n grows faster than it beyond a point. But why, you may ask? It's because the given computable function can be represented by a single Turing machine, which by definition has a fixed number of states. That is, there is a Turing machine which if given a tape with n written on it, it'll write f of n onto the tape. On the other hand, sigma n maxes over all Turing machines with n states. So beyond a point, sigma can reference the computable function's Turing machine and use it to produce larger outputs if that's necessary. In other words, for large enough n, sigma can use f. There's more to the proof than that, since to use f, we first need to write n onto the all zeros tape. But that's the general idea. And this is where I said, oh, but that was the last time. Now let's take a different perspective. The original perspective in Radu's 1962 paper. He presented it as a game. And when playing this game, all tools of science and mathematics are at our disposal. But there's a perfect way to play the game. From the limited perfect play we've discovered so far, it appears the ultimate tool comes from number theory. In particular, it relates to the Collatz conjecture. Before we get into the details, we should appreciate this as one of those rare moments where two apparently unrelated but remarkable things are linked at a level so fundamental we didn't see it coming. On one end, we have a game of Turing machines designed originally to present a well-defined non-computable function. And on the other, we have the Colox conjecture, sometimes called the simplest math problem no one can solve, conjectured totally independently. In my mind, this is utter confirmation that the Colox conjecture isn't some quirky puzzle, but truly exceptional since we found it at a peak of computation. When I first read this, I was like, what? Why is it here? Okay, let's get specific. With n equals five states, what exactly is the machine that halts with the most ones doing? Well, we haven't actually proven that we found the five state busy beeper machine, but it's quite likely we have it. It's likely to be this machine, which halts with 4,098 ones. Now this machine runs for tens of millions of steps, so I can't show the tape history. We'll need a more condensed way to represent things. Let C of M represent a tape with a long string of ones. In fact, there are M ones in the string and then there are infinite zeros going off to the left and to the right. Also, the machine is in state A above the zero cell on the left side. So this function represents a specific configuration of the tape and machine. Now what the five state busy beaver machine does depends on how many ones are in the string. If the number of ones is a multiple of three, it'll transform that tape into one that has this many ones. So the three multiplier became a five multiplier. 
and we added six. Also, doing this requires a lot of steps, in particular, this many. Next, if the number of ones has a remainder of one when divided by three, then we perform a similar operation. Finally, if the number of ones has a remainder of two, then we take some steps and halt with a tape that can't be represented with our C notation, but has K plus four ones. Now let's see this. If we start with an all zeros tape, we first take 15 steps to produce a block of six ones. Next, we take 73 steps to produce a block of 16 ones. And this continues until we halt with 4,098 ones. So what does this have to do with callouts? Well, this behavior is like a tuned version of the callouts operation. To see this, let's rewrite this operation. You can think of it as repeatedly applying a certain function g of m, this function, which applies simple functions depending on the remainder after dividing out three. Now let's compare this to the famous collox function, which is this. We see it's also applying a simple function, but depending on the remainder after dividing out two. If we look at these, we can see these operations are from the same family. They both apply a simple function depending on a remainder, and the functions applied involve simple multiplication, division, and addition. These functions differ only in their choice of integers, but otherwise are quite similar. And what is the cause conjecture? It states that given any m, if you start with that m, then apply the cause function, and apply it again, and again, and keep doing that, then eventually we will reach one. And the mysterious thing about callouts is, it's very simple to describe, but it behaves chaotically. And it's this combination of simplicity and chaos that makes it an apex option for the busy beavers. To understand this, let's take a step back. When playing the busy beaver game, we're first given an n, like n is equal to five. If we think of writing this state table as writing a program, then intuitively, we can think of n as the maximum length of the program. So if n is small, the program can't be very complex. So we need a short program that does a ton of work and then halts. And this is where callouts comes in. It's short to express, but behaves chaotically. In fact, we know it's the best at doing this because the busy beavers consider all programs below a certain length. If something was better, callouts wouldn't have been selected. Now the question is, what happens at n is equal to six? Well, at this level, it's unlikely we know the busy beaver. So we can only talk about our best machine so far. This is our champion machine, and it applies an exponential version of a callouts-like function. To see this, let C of M refer to some tape encoding that depends on M. All you need to know is that the machine can read the integer M from whatever this encoding is. When we start with the all zeros tape, we take 45 steps to produce C5. Then the behavior depends on the remainder when four is divided out. If the tape doesn't encode a multiple of four, then those get mapped to these tapes. The important thing to note is the multiplier k gets exponentiated. That's gonna be the source of a lot of crazy growth. And for all mappings, it takes on the order of nine to the k plus three steps. It only halts when a multiple of four is encoded on the tape. At that point, it'll write on the order of k plus three once. Ultimately, this creates a chain of 17 function calls, which creates ridiculous growth. One simplifying explanation I saw was, imagine we have a function of 10 to the m. Then it's approximately like the machine is recursively calling this function 15 times, giving us a tower of exponentials 15 terms tall. So clearly, the busy beavers are quick to exploit recursion to generate ridiculous growth. And what happens for n larger than six? We don't know. That's the uncharted territory of incomprehensibly explosive algorithms. So if we don't know the busy beaver algorithms for larger n, what else can we say? Well, in the last video, we discovered that the busy beavers encode the answers to famous open problems in mathematics. To dig into this, let's discuss a new function that is also called the busy beaver function, the shift function, S of n. It counts the max number of times the machine shifts before halting. So earlier, when we saw tape histories, instead of looking at the number of ones written, we're looking at the number of steps taken. This function is similarly pathological to the ones function, but it'll be easier to work with. Now, last time, we mentioned there's a 27 state Turing machine that halts if and only if Goldbach's conjecture is false. It does this by looking for counterexamples to the conjecture. If it finds one, the conjecture is false and it halts. 
Otherwise, it checks endlessly and never halts. Now here's the kicker. If we're given S of 27, then we would have a finite algorithm to solve Goldbach. All we do is run the Goldbach machine up until S of 27. If it hasn't halted by then, and since we know S of 27 is the max runtime of any 27 state machine, then we know the machine never halts. And so Goldbach must be true. Now, S of 27 is an absurd number. So this is not a practical solution. However, it shows that S of 27 turns a question of infinities into a mere finite calculation, which means it resolves the hardest part of the problem. And so what is the hardest part addressed by the shift function? It's the halting problem. We can't compute the function because the halting problem forbids a general finite algorithm. And what's interesting is Goldbach is just one question encoded in the busy beavers. In reality, a massive set of questions may be framed this way. So knowing the shift function turns many questions of infinity into finite computations. And so this means that the core of all these mathematical problems is the halting problem. This radically elevates the halting problem. If only we could look at an arbitrary state table and tape and decide if it halts before we run it, we'd have a general math answering oracle. So the halting problem really is at the foundation of mathematics. I never saw it from this perspective, so I find myself again saying, what? Now I want to end the video here, but I can't because we have an incoming asteroid of a theorem. If T is a computable, arithmetically sound axiomatic system, then there exists an integer nt such that for all n greater than nt, statements of the form s of n equals some number k cannot be proved in t. We saw this last time, but let's dig in. To understand an axiomatic system, we define an axiom, which is a statement assumed to be true and is generally considered self-evident. For example, every number equals itself. Next, an axiomatic system is a set of axioms from which other statements are proved. And this is how pure mathematics normally proceeds. Some things are assumed and then theorems are deduced from them. Next, computable just means we can programmatically apply rules of deduction to produce theorems from axioms and other theorems. Arithmetically sound means the system is powerful enough to produce the natural numbers and the associated theorems we independently accept as true. Now here's the punchline. This statement applies to our modern foundations of mathematics. And so this will apply, which means our mathematics will never prove the busy beavers beyond a point. They are fundamentally unknowable. Ultimately, this will come down to some individual Turing machine for which we can't prove halts or doesn't, which is just wild to contemplate. It's not that such a machine is complicated or takes a while to decipher, it's that there does not exist logical deductions that produce the answer. It just makes you think, what are these machines doing? Mathematics seems so omnipotent, and yet this device does something truly beyond it, beyond all of it, beyond de deductive reasoning itself. What is it doing? We can shed some light on this by understanding the proof. To do that, we're gonna need Kurt Gödel. First, a system is consistent if no contradictions can be proved from it. Now, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem states that no consistent system, strong enough for arithmetic, can prove its own consistency. Okay, that's it. Now here's the proof. Let M be a Turing machine that enumerates all possible proofs of T when started on the all zeros tape and halts if there is a proof of zero equals one, a contradiction. Now, since T is sound, that means it's consistent and so won't produce such a contradiction. And so M never halts. And by the second incompleteness theorem, T can't prove M never halts. So there we have it. It's machines like M that are inscrutable to our mathematics. And this helps my intuitions. I accept that an axiomatic system can't yield a proof regarding the computation of all possible proofs. Yes, I can imagine that breaking the rules of logic. Okay, and this is where I'll cut the video. If I don't st stop suddenly at some point, I'll be talking for hours. What I can say is, if I kept going, I'd discuss the conjectures. Those give us expert intuitions about this bizarre function and show us how little we actually know about it. All that's left is a few thank yous. First, my patrons, who think I add enough value to their life that they send me money. Gotta say, I love that. Second, thank you to Sean Lagaki, a busy beaver champ himself, for helping me understand the busiest machines. I would have been sunk without them. Next, Scott Aronson's Busy Beaver Frontier paper was also huge, obviously. I must have referenced it like 20 times. So thank you to him and everyone referenced in that paper. And finally, thank you for watching. And until next time.